Police will deploy 200 more frontline officers on night shifts this summer, Toronto's mayor and police chief announced Thursday as part of a $15 million plan to curb gun violence. A day earlier, police issued an arrest warrant in one of the city's highest-profile shootings of the summer, the June 30 killings of Javant Smart, a 21-year-old rapper also known as Smoke Dog, and 28-year-old Ernest Modakwe. Abdul Qadir Hanjwal, 22, is facing two counts of second-degree murder, while a second unidentified suspect is charged with attempted murder. The death toll in the city's wave of shootings this year reached 26 on July 8 with the killing of 25-year-old Kareem Hirani in North Toronto. The killings has renewed efforts by researchers and advocates to treat gun violence as a problem of public health, urban design and economics, not simply a criminal justice problem. Here's a deeper look at how the debate about root causes is unfolding. 27 people have been killed and many more injured by gun violence in Toronto this year, which is up from the year before. By this time in 2017, only 16 people had been killed by gun violence and 70 recorded as injured. The Globe and Mail, source, Toronto Police Service data share the dead come from all over Toronto and all walks of life. They range in age from 17 to 45. They were killed at home, in their cars, on the street, in Kensington Market and outside nightclubs. Two are young rappers who were mourned by Toronto's music scene. These are their names, and the dates they were shot, Shaquille Wallace, 22, January 9, Sean Kinghorn, 44, March 2, Christopher Reed, 38, May 7, Ernest, Kosi, Modakwe a.k.a. Coba Prime, 28, June 30. The city's mayor and police chief have linked many of the killings to gang activity, though police have offered few details on what is driving the violence between those gangs. In June, officers in Toronto and surrounding jurisdictions laid more than 1,000 charges against 75 alleged members and associates of the Five Point Generals, which police said were significantly disrupted by the sweep though they acknowledge that gang activity would persist. In a July 3rd radio interview, Mayor John Tory spoke in general terms about shootings in recent years, saying police have told him, it's a combination of turf wars that they have over drugs and other kinds of things like that. He also clarified that he was not suggesting the victims were connected with gangs, but rather the people who shot them. Neighborhood rivalries do play a role in gang violence, Paulo's Dubreisis, executive director of the Regent Park Community Health Center, told The Globe and Mail. But they are conflicts that successive generations have inherited for years, he says. It can be a very difficult and complex situation. That's why, for me, this notion of good guys and bad guys really needs to be put away. There are also complex reasons why young men may affiliate themselves with gangs, many having to do with economics and racial discrimination meaning the criminal justice system is not enough to dig out the root causes, experts say. We believe that nothing short of long-term, sustained investments in neighborhoods, in young people, will get us through this long-term, sustained income inequality gap that we are seeing, says Danielle Zanotti. President and CEO of United Way Greater Toronto Toronto is still living with the legacy of another deadly summer of gang-related crime. In 2005, the year of the gun ended with the highly publicized death of a 15-year-old girl, Jane Kreba, in the crossfire of a Boxing Day shootout on Young Street. In all, 52 people were killed and 359 shot that year, prompting dramatic changes in police tactics for fighting gang crime. In 2006, police created the Toronto Anti-Violence Intervention Strategy, TAVIS, which deployed more police to neighborhoods that had seen escalating crime. The plan was meant to be temporary, but in 2012, then-Mayor Rob Ford pressed for more funding as the city saw another deadly attack, this time on a Scarborough block party. Premier Dalton McGuinty's government made Tavis's funding permanent, though that funding was nearly cut in half in 2015 under his successor, Kathleen Wynne, who planned to eventually phase out the task force. The unit was disbanded in 2017, but this year, Ms. Wynne was replaced as premier by Doug Ford, the former Toronto mayor's brother, who has proposed to revive Tavis. 
Tavis and strategies like it have been divisive in Toronto communities who say they're being over-policed. The task force was criticized for stopping black and indigenous people for street checks in disproportionate numbers, collecting information from people not suspected of any crime. That practice, widely known as carding, put the city and province under pressure from civil rights advocates who said the policy was racially discriminatory. Early last year, the Wynn government passed legislation that required police to explain to people they stop that they have a right not to answer, and officers must explain their reasons for stopping people and give receipts of the interactions. But amid 2018's gun violence, one Toronto area police chief suggested that Carding's demise was to blame. Chief Jennifer Evans of Peel Regional Police told local politicians that the force has been hamstrung by last year's legislation against street checks. This has empowered criminals, who think officers won't stop them, they now are more confident that they will get away with carrying guns and knives, Chief Evans said in a statement to The Globe. But experts caution that there is no easy way to link changes in police practices to specific rises in crime. The latest gun violence has brought uncomfortable deja vu to neighborhoods like Regent Park, which has seen a decade of revitalization in social housing initiatives to repair its reputation for poverty and crime. Regent Park was where rapper Smoke Dog, one of the summer shooting victims, grew up. Shreya Ibrahim, founder of the support group Regent Park Mothers for Peace, told The Globe that an ongoing cycle of violence has left those in the neighborhood reeling from trauma. Communities are getting overwhelmed by this, Ms. Ibrahim said. This needs to stop. Here's a list of the things the City of Toronto and police forces have done, or suggested doing, to curb the violence so far. Deploying 200 more officers on night duty, at a cost of $3 million to be paid for by the city asking for $12 million in funding for existing social programs for at-risk youth in communities pressing the province to tighten bail conditions for people convicted of previous gun offenses from reports by Molly Hayes, Jeff Gray, Nadine Youssef, Jack Hamm, and the Canadian Press, 